Welcome to Wider Lens, a podcast brought to you by the Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario. And I'm your host, Annie Bradley, writer, director, and chair of DGC Ontario. Today on the podcast, we move beyond the frame, having a candid conversation with key creatives from the hit Hulu series, Handmaid's Tale. It's so hard to match the talent that we've got on this production in Toronto, anywhere. The scale of the show and the prestige of the production has presented so many Canadian creatives with watershed moments in their careers, including some of our guests today. In this episode, we'll be talking to some of the remarkable team behind the series, creator and executive producer Bruce Miller, picture editors and DGC Ontario members Wendy Hallam-Martin and Chris Donaldson, and lead actor, executive producer, and now season four director, Elizabeth Moss. So uh, I wanted to start off today with just saying that I watched the entire season yesterday. Oh my gosh, I'm so <laughs> I'm sorry. S- <laughs> no. Are you okay? And I, Yeah, I am. Um, and I have to say that I'm a huge fan of the show, but it was an extraordinary experience. And kudos to everyone involved because I felt that it was an, an incredibly new and, and powerful powerful journey. So uh, I can't thank you enough for that, for the work. Um, I wanted to start sort of with saying that I think that, you know, many women, and I can speak for myself, but many women breathed a sigh of relief when Handmaids launched initially, because um, although it's been very challenging and and difficult at times to watch, I think uh, that it was a, it so beautifully captured the sort of tangible unease that women feel every day that we feel every day, whether we work on Wall Street or live in Gilead or work at Walmart. And I I just wondered if, you know, it's such a beautiful articulation in such a sort of horrific and compelling way. If you could, maybe Bruce, just how do you feel about that ongoing responsibility of the response to the show and your message and the message as a creator? Um, I, I don't know if I, well, thank you, first of all. And I don't know if I feel so much um, responsibility as, it's kind of reflecting my own experience. I mean, I'm very lucky to work with a lot of women who are not just open and communicative, but don't mind kind of being interrogated about what their feelings are. So the Wendy and Lizzie, you know, particularly, but I think that that what you describe kind of as the the unease that women feel on a daily basis is is invisible to a lot of men. So the fact is, women don't know what's invisible to men. Men know. So having these guys very patiently explain to this man what I'm not seeing allows me to kind of... So for me, it's just a reflection of my journey of discovery, kind of, you know, uh, and in this case, having... There's the journey of discovery that the show is, and then there's the journey of discovery of working with these artists is, which is separate and wonderful, but separate. (laughs) <laughs> right. And, and Elizabeth, like, how do you, I mean, this has been an in- incredible journey for you as an actor. So, uh, I mean, how does that, how do you feel about that, that response, that sort of responsibility in, in regards to the character of June? Uh, you know, Bruce and I kind of talk about a lot how essentially for, for us, it's about a, uh, a woman who is trying to create a better future for her children. And, um, and it's about a, it's about a mother and it's about a friend and it's about, um, a girlfriend and it's, it's a sister, you know, it's about somebody who is just like a lot of women in a, in a lot of ways. And she's not a superhero and she doesn't have special powers and she doesn't, and she's not a villain and she's not, you know, she's complicated and she's got a lot of gray areas. And I think that's something that we always try to kind of keep remembering even though she's had some superhuman moments as a lot of women and mothers can uh you know she essentially is just a human and a person and so I think identifying that experience I think is what audiences have really identified with is that they can see themselves in in these characters and obviously especially June as the sort of leader of the pack Absolutely. And I think that's what connects it, everybody, even though this world seems so, well, maybe not lately, you know, unreal. Uh, I think that everybody finds a little bit of themselves in June's journey and, and of all the other characters. Um, 
let's talk about season four. Um, I really would love to talk about Bruce and, 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 and probably Elizabeth, how you came up with, do you guys sit down in the creative process? Is there an overarching dominant theme that you want to explore when you're looking at the season? How, if you could just speak a little bit about that creative process. Well, I think that the creative process has changed kind of over time. I mean, it's so much June's show. It's The Handmaid's Tale. So in some ways, you know, you kind of break forward with the story together, you know, Lizzie and I, um, because it because she's creating this character that's moving forward through time and she's discovering things along the way. And so am I. So I think that, you know, in some ways um, there is no kind of sitting down and starting to talk about the future. Lizzie and I talk about the future all the time. I mean, whenever I sit down with the writing staff, I find that a lot of it is reflective in conversations I've been having all season with all of these people about the story and where it was. So I think that um, uh, Lizzie and I, you know, at the beginning I was writing the show and Lizzie was, you know, making another show. Um, but uh, over the years as she's, uh, you know, moved up and, you know, as a producer and started to direct and also as just years go by, I think that uh, the best way the show works is for us to, kind of be an open communication about the character and how we feel about the character. She's very kind to bring me in on kind of the intimate actor choices that she makes, which which are revealing, you know, when you're an actor, you say, I could do this or I could do this. It shatters the illusion of I can only do this, you know, that, that you know, June does this. It seems real. June could do this or could do this is an interesting conversation. But she's kind enough to bring me into that, respectful enough to bring me into those conversations. And then because of that, we you kind of realize that it's a journey you're taking together. It's not me telling her what to do. And it's not June telling her what to do. It's us working together to kind of push it forward. You seem to have, like, for me, this 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 last season when I was watching it yesterday, and, and I think we'll we'll talk about this in regards to the the sort of the uh, the constraints that COVID put on the creative process for season four because you were starting and then you stopped and then you came back into it. And I really want to dig into that. But one of the things that I really felt was that you were exploring the price of freedom this season and what that cost was. And I felt that it was a, a really sort of cautionary tale about the outcome of all of the seasons that have come before it. And maybe if you could just talk a little bit about that I felt that you really went inside the characters this season, both visually and story-wise. Well, I would kick that to to these guys, especially Lizzie, to talk about. I think the whole reason, one of the central reasons the show is good is that it's cumulative. And that's what makes TV hard because for someone like Lizzie, who really every moment the character takes is filed away as part of a real human being, that cumulative nature of television is much more difficult. You know, we have to talk about her remembering how she felt, you know, seven episodes, seven seasons ago about this or this little thing, because we're going to play off of that. But because we are kind of trying to build cumulative television, that's what makes it more uh, powerful. So I think that the what I would say to these guys is these guys pay so much attention to making sure things build logically on one another from a story point of view, from a character point of view. That seems to be the the real central thread that that holds the audience. And I think what you've done with Handmaid's Tale is, uh, and I'd like to sort of dig into this creative relationship that you have a wonderful group of key creatives from yourself with Elizabeth, with the actors, with some of the directors, and also, of course, the editors. And what has this meant for you creatively when you're uh, articulating story? Is it, do you feel that this ongoing relationship has made it very stronger? I mean, if you could just speak a little bit, maybe, uh, Wendy, if you could talk about you coming on the show and then how that experience has uh, developed over the four seasons. Sure. Um, I came onto the show, I took over on the pilot and um, I remember sitting in the chair my first day going, I don't know how to cut this kind of TV. This is just something so special. I, I just felt like I was not, it was too good for me. Um, and then I realized that I had to completely unlearn what I had learned over the years and just go with my gut and 
you know, I, I often say Bruce has, has, um, you know, a crystal ball and he not only knows what's happening in politics and life and the show just is one step ahead of that, unfortunately. Uh, he also has a crystal ball as far as putting the right people together. And when I started to work on the show, I had a long relationship with Lizzie in the sense that she's June and I look at her every day and, and I don't need to mold her performance whatsoever, but I felt like I got to know her from what Lizzie was giving me. And it was kind of a shorthand from not only her being a, an actor, but also an exec producer and hearing her notes. So our sensibilities were already on the same page and long conversations with Bruce as well. And my collaboration with Chris, we, we constantly look at each other's shows and, and give each other's notes and thoughts. And, and so it was kind of like a dream team by accident in a weird way. Uh, so when Lizzie came to be director, I felt like I already knew what maybe she wanted. And, and we sort of had a, a shorthand, you know, um, which I hope she agrees with. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely do. <laughs> So, and Chris, if you could just talk a little bit about your journey on the show. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I've been on it since the first season as well, episode two. Um, and right away, you know, it was pretty clear we were onto something special. You really can't have any sense of how that will appeal to anything beyond the people that are working on it. But it felt like, well, I don't know if anybody's ever going to watch this, but this might be the best thing I've ever done. Um, and then, uh, so I just wanted to pick up on something actually you said, Annie, which was about the what could be uh, sort of the transient nature of television. And I think a part of what has happened is, on certainly in post, but in a lot of directors and writers, like everyone is stuck around. And so therefore, there's, there's kind of an emotional knowledge that Wendy and I carry in the post-production uh, over the course of four seasons that since we've been there from the very beginning with Reed Morano, our pilot director, who was incredibly uh, insightful in terms of how to bring this story to life, um, we've been able to sort of maintain a sort of emotional consistency. I mean, Wendy and I end up doing 80% of the episodes. So it feels like part of what makes this series special, certainly for me, is the fact that we have five years of working together very closely and collaboratively and with a great deal of trust. So we've been building that since the very beginning, since, you know, I remember in my first call with Bruce, he said, uh, push it as far as you can possibly take it and we'll bring you back. So to step in a chair and to receive performances like Lizzie and the writing, the directing, the shooting, and being told, we want you to push this as far as you can pushably, possibly take it, which is another way to say, we want you to put everything you have into it. And we'll respect that and protect that. And that's the kind of contribution we want from you. And that, you know, like if literally five people had ever seen this show, just the experience of working on it would have been the most tremendously rewarding thing imaginable. That's a, a huge amount of creative freedom. And, and that, uh, you know, obviously putting that trust into the editing team, but also not only that, but it elevates everybody's work. And it feels like that's what's happening season after season. Um, season four, I just wanted to talk a little bit about episode three, The Crossing. And um, first of all, like, did you, did you always want to direct? Is this something that you could became organic? Uh, and how did that come to be? Why now? Quite honestly, I thought, well, if I'm going to give it a try and see if I like it or see, and see if I'm any, any good at it, this would be a great place to do it because of the, you know, collaboration with everybody, because I know it so well, and, and also because of the creative freedom that, that everyone's been talking about. Um, so I figured, like, you know, okay, if I'm going to play my first um Chris, Chris and I love the baseball analogies. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna play my first first game. It's gonna be with the, you know, with the home team. Um, so I, and then I, I just I, 
fell in love with it. But I also have to say, I had this, the most incredible, perfect possible situation of like the best scripts, the best collaboration with the writers of those scripts, Bruce being the writer of The Crossing. And, and then every step of the way, a cast that uh, I know and love and has been incredibly generous with their performances. I mean, I never realized how, I never realized until directing how much like actors just honestly make you look so good because <laughs> they're brilliant. Um, and then, and then landing in the quote unquote editing room, unfortunately, one of our great regrets is that, um, and I'm, I'm hoping things are different next year, but our great, one of our great regrets between me, Chris and Wendy is that we never got to be in an actual editing room together. Um, we did it all remotely, which was fine, but I would love to do that one day. Uh, but then landing in the room with these guys and getting to see what that part of the experience was like. Cause I've always been in post as a producer and been as, you know, vocal and, and had a, had my place there, but it obviously a totally different thing as a director. Um, so I had the best possible experience is, is what I'm saying. It was, um, very, uh, trusting and collaborative and, free, uh, and very supported, incredibly supported. Wendy, um, so you are nominated for an Emmy. Um, congratulations. We're all very excited for you, um, for The Crossing. Uh, so deserving. Um, did you, I mean, I know, did you feel, did you know that, that there was something, I mean, every episode of this season is special, and, but did you notice something extraordinary happening when you were cutting this? I really did. Um, I mean, it was Lizzie's first episode, first show ever, and she just nailed it at every turn. So I would get dailies and I'd be so inspired. And just, just the way she handled the material and the way that the actors elevated their performances. I mean, I think Lizzie's so, so loved in so many ways. And I think that everybody just wanted to do their best work. And we were constricted by COVID. And so there wasn't a lot of extra time to go and do other things. So I think we just all buried ourselves in our work. And, and so, you know, receiving her footage and seeing her vision was just astounding to me. I mean, she walked in and knew what she wanted. She was open to ideas. She collaborated with all the right people. Um, it was just honestly a gift. It um, was truly remarkable. I, I was so proud of it in the end we got to a really great place and and um yeah it's it's one of my favorite episodes of all time it was certainly harrowing and uh thank you for that because i love a great harrowing episode um it just felt like i was inside june scraping at the residual of trauma it just was beautiful like really, really beautiful, um, beautiful job. Uh, Wendy, I'm going to read a quote from you because I thought it was uh, quite beautiful. And it says, this show cuts like no other show I've ever done before. You hang on shots a lot more than you normally would. You don't always cut to reactions. You have to feel it. You have to have a gut reaction as to how it should be cut. You throw out what you've learned over the years to show emotion, to help evoke empathy. Um, did you feel that you had this emotional intuition? I know you came into the show and you said, I, I don't know how to do that. How do you, how did you, how did you get to that place? I, I think it, I think it was all there. It was all laid out before me, um, from Bruce's brilliant scripts to the performances on the day, uh, to the direction. And I just had to navigate and trust my gut. I think it was all about trust. Uh, I think I knew how the how I would want it to look and how it should go together, but um, you really had to feel your way through it. And and there were a lot of scenes I'd assemble and go, oh, that's terrible. Like, what am I doing wrong? And and then I'd start again, and then I would just learn to trust my gut, really, because it was all there. I mean, uh, we're all huge fans of the book, and and Bruce just elevated it on the page and. The rest of it was just, I, I don't know, I can't, I can't say enough good things about it. And it just sort of developed over time, you know. It was really an organic process, I guess. 
Bruce, I just want to talk to you, go back a bit about how season four came to be, because I believe if I'm not mistaken, you were up and running. You had articulated the season and you were up and running when COVID hit. And then you had to stop shooting and take a break of about six months and come back. I can only imagine, um, this is a show that has magnificent set pieces. You know, it has, you know, there's scenes with a, a lot of background, a lot of, uh, a lot of constraints that were put on to the creativity of the show. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you reinvent, you reimagined that. Uh, well, I think there were two, two big things. I think the first thing was um, to, uh, you know, the first creative decision is to try to be a good manager and make sure no one loses their car in the next two weeks and no one loses their apartment. So, so, um, Lizzie was central in that we, you know, by, before we even started to ask people for money, we had, there was a fund set up and, and people, you know, and money available for the crew and, and for, for anybody who needed it. I think that was the first thing. Um, the second thing is we had to revise the scripts, but you have to think about what you're going to do. You can't start revising for protocols. You don't know what you're going to, to have to follow. So I think the, the, the thing that we tried to do with the scripts uh, was come up with a goal. And the goal was to create space for Lizzie and the crew and the people in post to do their jobs as they normally would, to create space for them to be actors and to be directors. Because it doesn't matter how safe you are if they can't do their actual job. So I think what we started to do with the script is to, as much as we could, pare down the stories so that they would allow them to do them normally. Um, so a lot of that, we got lucky with a few episodes, episode three, where it was set in a, in a few characters in a small location. Terrible luck with, with the episode that took place on a boat that was planned to be shot in the middle of the summer. In, 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 <laughs> and, yeah. and it was in the middle of the winter, and um, <laughs> it's very different and awful and... and Lizzie, who will go into any amount of milk cars that I want to, done love boats, and so, um, so uh, anyway, we all. But I, the the biggest difference was I was there at the beginning, and then I came home, and I never went again. And they made a TV show on their own um, up there. Um, uh, you know, Lizzie was there on set; those guys were in post, but um, on on set, I, it just you know, I don't I don't think necessarily Lizzie stepped up. As a director, I th this season, I think she stepped in as a director. Right, right. I mean, it, for me, as an audience member, um, I felt that the paring down, I mean, I know what the restrictions of COVID are and, and you know, having shot through it all this past 18 months, I, I, was, I was struck by how things that, for example, you know, we, we all know that the you know, the challenges were changing daily and the numbers were changing daily and how many people you could have on sets and background and all of these sorts of things. But I felt there was a really remarkable way of by stripping, by, by having some of those scenes be so limited, it felt like it was articulating the themes of the season where I felt like, you know, Lizzie shows up in the testimony and, and you know, June shows up in the testimony to speak her truth and there is no one there to listen to her. And it just felt like it really empowered the story and really made it even more poignant. Um, and the number of times that that happened, and I, I thought it, that it really felt like I got to know the characters intimately, their flaws and their nuances, much more so in the season. Like it was cumulative. It paid off that we got the time to spend with these characters intimately, um, seeing their struggle. And I, I think it was really, really quite powerful. Um, I'm going to ask about the testimony, Elizabeth. Um, the choice there, which is an awesome and very bold one, to do the uh, the one take in the in her testimony. Did you talk about that? Did you talk about it with you know your creative collaborators, your editor, et cetera? How did that all come? Uh, it's a great question because it was actually great a great answer, right, Wendy? <laughs> So, um, so yes, yeah, so that was a, it was a choice that was in the storyboards um, that Stuart Biddlecombe, my DP, and I did. Um, we hid the choice in the storyboards because we were afraid that if somebody saw it, they would be nervous about it. 
Um, so it's in there, but you can't like really tell that it's one shot. And you then... weren't worried about me, <laughs> were you? I was, you know what? I was actually worried that it wasn't going to work. And so because of that, and I remember, I, I remember saying to Stu, I said, as I said, look, as a director, I'm not sure if the actress, if the actress can pull this off and not any, you know, not anything negative about her, but I'm just not sure if it works. Like if you can play, yeah. Like if you can play this whole thing and I've never done anything like this before, so I won't know until we do it. And so we had this crazy idea and then, but I shot all the coverage. So I did close-ups on everybody and covered every single, every person in that room except for the security guards got coverage for that whole speech because I was like, I don't know. I don't know if this is going to work and I'm not going to mess this incredible scene up by not having it. So I went and I did all the coverage and then Wendy got it and she saw that I had done all of the coverage. So assumed that I wanted the coverage and the original assembly that I got of it had all that coverage in it. And it was good. Like it was fine. It was, it was good. But there was like something missing for both of us. And I remember saying to her, you know, Wendy, I got to tell you, I had, I had this crazy idea that like maybe it will play in just this one shot. And she goes, you won't believe it. That's how I originally assembled it. That was my instinct. And I assumed that you wanted the coverage because you shot it. But she and then she literally, it took like, I mean, it took like five minutes, Wendy, because you, she was like, I have it. I already did that. And so she showed it to me and we both were in tears and we both were like, okay, that's the only version of this that actually works. Um, so it was a very, it was like a, it was a cool collaborative moment and a testament to Wendy and her uncanny ability to be inside the show and inside June's head. Um, it's like, she knows exactly where we're supposed to be at exactly the moment we're supposed to be there. And it's, truly scary um so it was uh it was a it was a fun moment wasn't it Wendy it really was yeah <laughs> it was it was a great experience I also remember that the last scene in episode three where both you and I cried every time yeah. <laughs> yeah. and here we thought we were gonna lose that scene yeah you've never met two bigger fans of 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 the, of the show I mean literally every time we saw that last scene we both were like it's so good <laughs> <laughs> like as audience members we weren't like congratulating ourselves we were just like it's just so sad all her friends have died yeah <laughs> unbelievably powerful now i know that there's a moment also too in the end of episode nine after june has just left nick the big romantic mo which you know Oh my God, those two back-to-back -back scenes. Um, but I just, I just want to talk to you about, there was a moment there where I felt there was a step away from the visual language of the show. There was jump cutting happening in the car. And the first time, at the first moment I was like, what? And, and was that like, where did that come from? Because it really worked. You saw all of these myriad of emotions and I was like, oh, but it was, it's not the usual. So I just wondered. I, I I would say actually, and I'll let Chris talk about it because it was completely one thousand percent his choice. But I will, I will actually say that is a that is original visual language of The Handmaid's Tale because that is in like the first a couple of episodes, if not maybe the first episode, Wendy, when she's like, there's a, there's there's some jump cutting I think on the on the bed and when you know before she goes out and sees like Nick. So that's like OG. Handmaid's Tale visual language. But yeah, go ahead, Chris. I want to talk about... Uh, yeah, well, you know, like I think that, say, you know, Lizzie is in the car. She's got the mic. She's got her little walkie. You know, she's like, are we ready? Okay, let's go. And then they're driving. And, you know, she'll just run a take and run a take. And, you know, my first instinct was to... Because she did it, it was 100% there, in and and out, and just watch June leave and watch it all pass through in a very natural, organic way. Um, and it is beautiful, it's beautifully acted. And, you know, for, for me, 
I also like to say, well, what else can we do here? What else could possibly be done? Because I, I felt that there was kind of a violence to the moment as well. Uh, and I think that that is very clearly articulated with the jump cuts, like that kind of cutting sort of ramps the emotion in a way that made it feel more violent for lack of a better way to do it. So it was, even if, it, you know, you can take out 18 frames and the effect is there. So we wanted ultimately to feel June zigzagging seesawing between all these incredible emotions. Uh, and so it just, it, it came out of that. And then, you know, we pushed it further and then we went, ah, no, maybe let's scale it back. You know, like it's, uh, you know, um, so yeah, it's just always trying to find the most, you know, honest and uh, intense emotional expression of a moment. And whether that is holding on a single shot for seven minutes, uh, or whether it's jumping through a shot that could just as easily play as a one or as well, you know, that's what we're always searching for. You know, like how, how do we define this? How do we express this? in the most emotional way possible. To me, it was just a, it was such a brilliant I idea because it was the, it was the only way to show that ping pong of emotion, right, Chris? Like it was the only way to show that you can feel that as she's driving away, she, she wants to jump out of the car and run back. She thinks that that was a wonderful experience. She's in love. She's laughing and she's crying. And it was the only way to kind of feel all of that in, an amount of time that is acceptable for, for the episode. Yeah. <laughs> but, and, and, and also again, to, to commend Lizzie, you could have all, she played it like as an actor, she did it. You know, there were in there, if she took us through all of that in one take completely naturally and organically, but yes, sometimes you do have to cut for time. But I, 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 I did like the, the sort of emotional violence of the jump cuts, I thought. And that's a lot of, Try the cut here. Try the cut there. What if you do that? What if you do that? What if you do that? Meanwhile, Lizzie had already chosen the Max Richter piece for there, so you're you're in this weepy emotional state <laughs> to begin with. So uh, it was fun to explore listening to Max Richter and yeah. trying a million different cuts. So, which which also leads me to music, which is such a signature part of the show, and such, it was such an unusual sort of pairing um, when it you know like the juxtaposition of pop, the pop music with the, you know, the deeply sort of emotional work from the very beginning. And Bruce, maybe you can talk about this because I, uh, I, I'm i wondering where this idea came from, where the genesis of this pairing or sort of this pairing came from. And, and, and f we're four seasons in and it still resonates powerfully um, throughout. Where do, where do those choices come from? I know sometimes, it, you know, is it a collaborative uh process as well um oh absolutely absolutely i mean everything we do um the the philosophy behind the the music is super simple for those kinds of songs it's you know the show is in retrospect the show is told as a memoir of june remembering and these are the things that were going through her head in the moment even unbidden you get weird songs in your head at weird times. And that's what it's about, is that it's not the song that she's trying to think of or putting on the moment. It's the song that happened to pop in your head when you happen to be doing this. And so um, sometimes they're very incongruous. Um, but, but I don't think ever, I, I mean, I actually think, it, I often say that we're playing counterpoint, but it's not counterpoint, it's on point. It's, it's, it's just her point. But um, initially I did a lot of, uh, uh, I, I want to say this is Reed Morano. Reed Morano made the first few musical choices that pushed us in this direction. This is absolutely her influence on the show um, and encouraged me to do the same. Initially, it was mostly my choices because it was such weird taste. But I think that as you move along, you don't want it to be the Bruce Miller's favorite song show because then it gets boring. And I think that, you know, so th this season especially, but as we've been going through, everybody makes choices and everybody in this call has had choices of songs that I had never heard. And that probably initially I didn't even like that ended up in the show and our favorites. Um, and, and this season, especially with, with Lizzie, uh, you know, Lizzie is making the choices that she, Elizabeth Moss likes for June. Um, and 
they aren't songs that I like, so I have the experience of the audience of just turning them on. The thing that Lizzie, I think, does that is she doesn't she doesn't you know say it's my way or the highway about music, which I think is is uh, the 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 best way to to kind of get it to work. You get things to kind of ring around in someone's head, and someone's not putting their foot down. You know, I have to do the same thing with the network because I make terribly odd choices. But just so you know, every single song that anybody in this room has ever chosen, or every song I've chosen, someone has said to me, you really seriously, you know, kind of that quiet voice of, you know, you're ruining the show, don't you? That if you do this, no, this is just awful. You know, it's like not even funny anymore. It's just you realize if you do this. So every song that you like, everyone we've chose, all the brilliant stuff in episode three, every one of those songs for the studio took me aside and told me I was ruining the TV show. <laughs> is that true, guys? A hundred percent of the time? Yeah, music is one of the hardest things I feel like we do on the show because as you and I always say, Bruce, it's so subjective. It's like, you know, my favorite song is gonna is 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 like you said, someone is going to hate it. So it's gonna be someone, someone is going to absolutely detest that particular song. And because it's subjective, it's music, it's it's such it's personal taste, you know. So it's but I feel like what you're right. Bruce, and I think this extends to a lot of creative choices, is we there's very much no my way or the highway from any of us. I think the only way that we ever get into that place is is when we want something and, you know, we're up against a, a, a larger power that is outside of our team, you know. Uh, but But when it comes to the creative choices on the show, they're just, it would be so bizarre if one of us said, this is the way that it's going to be. And I will absolutely never hear anything else from anyone. Like it just isn't the way that we work. And so it extends to music as well, where like there are choices for, for my episodes that I felt extremely strong about, but like, you know, that you cannot be bullish about it because that's just not the way that creative collaboration works on this show. And it, it's, it, and I would expect the same respect from, from, from everyone else, you know? Um, so Bruce and I tend to just kind of let things sit for a while. And, you know, sometimes I'll be like, I don't think this is right, but like, I don't know, think about it. But it's, it's, it's a very delicate collaboration, that one, the music, because it's so personal. And, and you have to take a lot of risks with music because, you know, like it's very easy to make a choice that, well, you know, a lot of people will like that, you know, and, and there are lots of, TV shows and movies and everything that make those choices. Yeah, a lot of people will like that. That's not, you know, ideally, I think it feels like, you know, two people sitting together in a room and one person says, oh, man, I hated that. And the person beside them goes, "That's that was my favorite music in the, in the season. Like, are you insane? Like, you risk having people hate something in order to have people love something. And we always make the choice that it's better for somebody to love this than for a bunch of people that go, yeah, it was pretty good. I like that. That was fine. That was fine. Yeah. And I will say we have a wonderful music supervisor too in Maggie Phillips, who is a genius at being cooler than any of us and smarter than any of us. And infinitely patient with, with me. Yes, yes, yes. But she's incredible at finding deeper cuts of things and things that are outside any of our boxes. And I mean, we're in season four if we're not breaking our hearts now, we should stop. I mean, the whole point is you do want it to matter to you that much. And I think that, that you know, when Wendy shows me Lizzie's cut when, and I go through and Wendy says, she does tell me that, you know, Lizzie made this choice because it was very important to her. And Lizzie, so, you know, Wendy is not saying it's mine. I love this. She's saying you should know that my director felt very strongly about this choice. And that kind of defending of other people's, respecting other people's creative choices, whether you're positive, negative, or neutral about them. I mean, I, I've heard Lizzie on calls defend choices I know that I've made and she's backed and a, a million times. And it's, it's out of respect for the artist rather than out of just, you know, when you love something in addition, you know, with somebody else, it's easy to kind of sing its praises. Uh, I just, I guess I want to talk a little bit about sh 
shooting the the show in in Toronto. And I now know we've been here for quite some time, but maybe we could just talk a little bit about originally when you came here, Bruce, had you shot here before? Was was there, a, did you have a knowledge of, of any of the, the crew here or the people here? And how do you feel now, uh, both you and, and Elizabeth, four years into, into, the, into the process? Uh, uh, when we first started to talk about Toronto, I had shot here before. Um, it had been a few years earlier and the crews and the facilities are advancing so quickly. It, it had only been a little bit of time and already I was looking at a whole new list of, of possible people and possible places. My concern was I was supposed to take place in Cambridge and I wanted it to look and feel like Cambridge. And I, when I was told I was going to Toronto, I was incredibly dubious. But once I looked around Toronto and I you know, grew up in, in New England, it, it worked exactly the same. It was exactly the same kind of three-story, four-story brick building as Cambridge. Um, so uh, that 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 was the reason I made the choice. The choice was artistic. It has been, I mean, I, I absolutely, an absolute pleasure in, on every level. The people that we've been able to work with, just how the city, how kind they've been to us in the midst of all of this craziness. Um, I... I I can't say enough good things. I, you know, I, I've, I've adored shooting there. I've adored living there. Um, uh, the people there are super patient when it comes to us being on their streets in the middle of the night. And, and, and anyway, it's wonderful. And they've taken such good care of, of all of us when we've been there, treated us like guests. So I'm, uh, it's been a wonderful place to shoot. The crew has been spectacular. The post-production crew has been spectacular. The actors, the uh, the local actors we've gotten are so well-trained and thoughtful. And they come on set completely awestruck, and then they do their work. They don't, like, it's amazing. So I can't say enough good things, and, and uh, I, I, I'm not going to speak for Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I echo all of that. I mean, it's so hard to match the talent that we've got on this production in Toronto, anywhere. I mean, in the world, it's, I am incredibly spoiled in the both on-set crew and the post-production team. It's some of the best people that I've ever worked with on anything. And I'm totally spoiled. And all I want to do is just continue to work with them on everything else. The crews that you work with, of course, they're all great in in very, you know, sort of varying ways, but I would say that I've just been unbelievably spoiled by this Toronto production and this Toronto crew. I I can tell you from the way people talk about uh, the crew and and the people that the coll key collaborators that work on the show, uh, when we talk to them at large, they have such a great respect for doing for the show and for their contribution to the show and. You know, I, I really think that it's been extraordinary how they've how they've also by doing that great level of work that you have put forward, um, they really feel like it has also stepped up their game, and they are now you know have that confidence building. and And maybe Chris and Wendy, I know I know you just want to work with Elizabeth, and um, but uh, how has this been for you this this journey as far as career building? Obviously, doing a show that has been you know, nominated for, what are we at, 75 Emmys now, I think, and 21 uh, in the upcoming Emmys, which is this astonishing for one season, and congratulations, it's well-deserved. But maybe you could just talk a little bit about what it's meant for you. Wendy? Um, it, it's meant absolutely everything. It has been such a pleasure and such a dream come true. It's really hard to go work for other people, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> Uh, I echo what Lizzie says. I feel spoiled rotten working with this this incredible crew. And I know everybody always says that about who they're with. and But this truly is special. It, it truly is a bubble of incredible people. So, um, yeah, I just, I just can't say enough great things about working with this group. It's been such a – it's opened so many doors as well. Um, you know, we've we've been – Chris and I have both been contacted by some really huge people in the industry uh, to come and cut their shows and um, all over the world, and it's been amazing. I don't want to go anywhere because I want to stick with Handmaids, uh, but, uh, you know, going forward, yeah, I'd love to continue this journey, um, especially with Lizzie and Bruce in any capacity possible. It's just been an absolute pleasure. 
Yeah, I would, I would completely concur. And certainly when you work on a show that is not only this high profile, but this sort of beloved and this artistic, you certainly do, you know, professional avenues open up for you. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I kind of feel like also hand in hand with that is when you're working with collaborators like this, you know, the, with the standing on the shoulders of giants type thing, like my sense of myself of what I can do as an editor and as an artist has been greatly expanded by these people, Wendy, Bruce, Lizzie, all the writers at EOP, like they have pushed me and given me the confidence to take chances in this and in all my other creative endeavors. You know, it's a, it's a real joyful and experience and incredible experience to, to work with people who are at the absolute best of their top of their field, asking you to collaborate with them and to bring your best work. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary to feel uh, that sort of inspired and, and um, so, yeah, so I feel like not just professionally, but creatively, so many things have opened up over the course of the last five years for me. And it's, it's thrilling and I can't wait to keep doing it over and over and over again, because we keep doing it over and over and over again differently. You know, the, the, the creative dynamic, the collaborative dynamic stays the same, but we're all pushing not to repeat ourselves, not to uh, get content and just go, yeah, that's good enough. Everyone is still pushing yeah. to work at the highest level, and that's incredible. Um, well, listen, I'm going to um, we'll sort of just wrap this up. I, I just wanted to say thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy, busy days I I would like to thank you for bringing the show to Toronto and uh, we feel very proud of the show and proud of the work that our members do on the show and all of the creative collaborators. And if you wanted to say one last thing, uh, each of you, maybe you could uh, tell me what sort of a favorite moment of season four was for you. Um, that would be really wonderful, just to wrap it up. Can we start with Bruce? Um, my favorite moment of season four is when the show shut down, as I was saying before, we put uh, a fund together for the crew, um, the cast and the crew and, and people working on the show to, in case they needed some money. And there was a, a, a the everybody on the cast immediately donated money. And there was uh, quite a bit at the beginning of the season. There was also when people signed on people could take money or they could, there was a button to donate money. At the end of the season, we had more money in it than we started with because more people donated it than took. So that's my favorite. That's by far my favorite moment of the season. Amazing. Elizabeth? How do you top that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. Um. Yeah, I mean, that was, and it's that's completely true. It was the craziest thing ever, wasn't it? Um, I mean, honestly, I, I feel like uh, there's so many, so many moments, but the um, the type of moment, I guess, if I can, that I, I loved was um, the late night phone calls, the working on the Sundays, the coming back and realizing we had all gotten through that six months and we were gonna try our best to return to work safely and to take care of everybody. The feeling of everybody being back on set and wearing their masks and washing their hands and taking their tests and making sure that they did everything that they could to keep everyone safe with absolutely zero complaint, not one word. And you're talking about like, you know, hardened, grip and electric guys who like can't be bothered to keep the fire lane open at the studio. And they haven't washed and their hands since season one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and yet everyone was so appreciative of being able to go back to work and not only have a paycheck to where they could live and feed their families, but also to do what they love and had this newfound appreciation for being able to do that and respect for that. And so to see everybody on set multiple, multiple times, multiple moments, multiple days come together and really, truly, like never before work as a team was truly just, it was, it was so inspiring. Wendy? 
I mean, these two have summed it up absolutely beautifully. Those are really the highlights. Um, I just think the connectivity was, you know, was stronger, weirdly, even though we were disconnected physically. So I think that was really great. And I think the, the best part about working on season four was early on knowing we had a season five. So it wasn't going to be a goodbye. I think that was pretty special, too. Uh, I feel feel like I should say something really shallow. Um, <laughs> like, oh, I, my lunches were, were really good. We started using this Hunger Hub service. Um, it's the birthday present I sent you. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. And Bruce sent me a one. I turned 50. You know, actually, why don't I go from there? Um, you know, turning 50, I turned 50 over the course of um, the, the fourth season. And I guess you can look at your life at 50 and go, what have I done? What are the things that have happened? And what came out of this horrible year and the time we had off was not just appreciation of the work, but an appreciation of each other. That these are people that have become family over the course, you know, we are our own little family. It was nice so, to be in people's houses working. That, yeah, I would say that I loved seeing like your dog running around or, you know, your, your, your kids running around. Poor like, Lizzie didn't get much time in her house, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was a beautiful, like to be able to, to, to appreciate first and foremost, that potentially the greatest thing you'll ever work on is filled with people who you love, care for, have become your good friends and family. That's to be able to come back to that environment with all that information in your heart and mind was pretty amazing. I think that all of us have had those big moments of recognizing what at the end of the day is really important over this past 18 months. And I think that the, if there is a silver lining of COVID, that's got to be one of the silver linings is that moment of recognizing, recognizing that, you know, the people that we do work with every day do matter and connecting with those people. And that's how great work gets done as well. It's the foundation of creativity is that connectivity. And on that uh, wonderful human note, I would love to wrap it up and say thank you so much for continuing to do the work that you do to be excellent in your fields um, and uh, for raising the bar always. It's been an extraordinary ride. Season four, I wish you all the luck going into the Emmys and I can't imagine what uh, the journey is going to be in season five, um, but I will be here waiting for it. Absolutely. So thank you so much, guys. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Everybody here at DGC Ontario is, uh, is going to be um, uh, very excited to hear um, this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast was produced by Katie Jensen and Michal Stein at Vocal Fry Studios. Our video producer is John Pakman. Our executive producer is Anne-Marie Stewart. And special thanks to Aviva Cohen and Laura DiGiralamo at DGC Ontario. And I'm your host, Annie Bradley. Special shout out to Elizabeth Moss, Bruce Miller, Wendy Helen Martin, and Chris Donaldson for joining us for this wonderful conversation today. We'll see you next time on Wider Lens.